Okay, thanks. So we can move on to the next talk by Guillermo from Madrid, who's going to talk about uh, primordial black holes as dark matter. Thank you. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about primordial black holes that, uh, as you know, were proposed many years ago in the late 60s and 70s. And these are black holes that are uh, formed before Big Bang nucleosynthesis. If we want them to be the dark matter, which is the point of the talk. And there are two main questions that I think are relevant. So one is um, what are the bounds on their abundance and whether they can be the dark matter or part of it. And, and then how do they form if, if they do at all and, and when, okay, in which in which period of the of the history of the universe. So just to give you a quick idea of what we are talking about, uh, these black holes are the heaviest dark matter candidate we we have thought of, I think. Uh, they are above uh, WIMPs, sorry, above uh, WIMPs and all the rest. And the, the, lightest, uh, the lightest ones that could be the dark matter are around 10 to the minus 19 solar masses or so, because the lighter ones would have evaporated by today due to Hawking radiation. And uh, it's usually thought that uh, if we find a black hole that is uh, lower than about a solar mass or so, this could be a, a primordial black hole because there are no, there are no known astrophysical uh, mechanism that uh, that could uh, form them. Okay. So zooming a little bit more into the possible masses, uh, black holes that are of the size of an asteroid, more or less, typical asteroid. Uh, they have a mass that is between one and uh, 100 solar masses or so. Instead, black holes that are uh, having a mass of a typical asteroid have the size of, a, of an atom, roughly, okay? So there is a huge range of uh, masses and sizes that uh, we can consider. And uh, in the context of inflation that I will be talking about, uh, the mass is, is going to, de to depend on uh, which is the, the time during inflation at which uh, the fluctuations that will give rise to this object are, are produced, okay? So uh, these ones here on the top are uh, the relevant ones if you're interested in seeing them through uh, black hole mergers at the uh, LIGO or uh, similar interferometers. And the ones at the bottom uh, are relevant because these are the ones that we think could comprise all the dark matter given the current constraints. And it's interesting that we can observe them indirectly, maybe through uh, gravitational waves, but of, uh, of a different kind from the ones uh, on the top of the, of the picture. This was here at the bottom, can be observed through the indirect, uh, sorry, induced gravitational waves that can be produced at second order uh, during inflation through the scalar fluctuations that give rise to, to these objects. Okay, we'll explain it a bit more later. The, the key point is that the, both of them can, can be linked to gravitational waves in one way or, or another. Okay. So what are the current bounds? Uh, is it possible to remove this uh, band here? No. because of the pointer, okay. It's not very important, it's just to, so people can get the, the address. Okay, so this is, this is taken from a, from a paper by Bradley Kavanagh and Han Green. And they have a website where there is a repository of different bounds on primordial black holes where you can go and and print them and uh, play with them if you want. And this is the, the standard situation uh, now accepted by almost everyone, in which uh, we're plotting on the vertical axis the abundance of primordial black holes as compared to the one of dark matter. And on the horizontal axis, we have the, the mass, okay? And basically uh, these huge uh, 
range of masses is excluded for primordial black holes to be the totality of the dark matter, but there is a window which is uh, in this uh, so-called asteroid mass window, which is what I was showing you in the previous plot, where they could be, in principle, all the dark matter, okay? And one of the interesting questions on, on this subject now is uh, th thinking of ways on, of, of constraining further this, uh, this window, okay? So the, the leftmost part of the plot is, is constrained by, by this uh, evaporation constraints from gamma rays and X-rays that we don't see, okay? With satellites like uh, Fermi, for example. And on the right, we have different constraints. At first, we have a uh, micro lensing, then uh, bounds from LIGO and uh, Virgo from <clears throat> the, the comparing the, the merger rates that are observed in these interferometers with the ones that would, you would expect if primordial black holes would be the dark matter. And then there are also some other bounds that come from the defects that, uh, that you would observe if black holes are accreting matter and, and then uh, releasing energy into the universe. And from the disruption of some objects like white dwarfs, for ex uh, sorry, white binaries, for example, uh, due to the, to the dynamics of these black holes. So let me go a little bit more into, into detail to the constraints. Now I cannot pass the, the slides anymore. <laughs> Maybe with the, like this, no? No, not even. Sorry? To highlight the slide. Uh, yeah, let's see. Mm, yes, thank you, Seth. <laughs> okay, so these bounds that I was, that I was uh, showing in the previous slide, assume that all the black holes have the same mass but this doesn't need to be the case. And uh, there are people that have work on trying to see how these bounds change depending on whether you assume different distributions for their masses or not. And typically the, the bounds get, uh, get tighter at, at all masses, although you have to interpret with a little bit more care what you mean uh, when you look at the left plot where I am assuming a monochromatic uh, so-called distribution. And um, when when you assume some distribution like the one on the on the right hand side, okay. So these evaporations bound, uh, as I said, come from uh, comparing the the flux. Uh, for example, this is the extragalactic diffuse flux that we measure here uh, with satellites like uh, Fermi and many others. With the spectrum that you would expect if you had some component of uh, primordial black holes. Uh, evaporating today. And uh, here, for example, uh, this little, uh, sorry, this bump that you see on the right is the contribution that you will have if you had a population of black holes of around 10 to the minus 17 solar masses with, an, with a fraction of, uh, of, of them that will account for all dark matter, okay? And by comparing the, the signal with the, with the data that we have, you, you can put, uh, you can put uh, a quite a strong bound. And there are, Several other observables that are related to to, evapor to evaporation of black holes. Yes. Just go to the previous slide for a moment. Yes. Um, oh, the previous that's one. Not the pre <laughs> yes. um, so, do you understand correctly that the blue dotted curve here? This is some model for the uh, astrophysical uh, diffuse X-ray background, and it underpredicts uh, the the spectrum at yes. around an MeV or so. How robust is that? The model. Yeah. Uh, or should, should I rather trust the double power law fit or should I trust the, the model and say, okay, there's an access there? The double power law <laughs> is something that we put by hand yeah. because uh, it, it happens yeah. that many astrophysical observations right. look like that. The other one is based on taking uh, the spectra of specific quasars and uh, doing a modeling of, of the mission of these uh, objects. But, but so it's quite possible that it misses some it, it uh, could, yeah. source categories. In, in fact, therefore, uh, if you okay. continue mm -hmm. taking data to the right of this plot, the uh, spectrum starts to rise up a little bit again. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a gap in between these two regions. And we don't really know how to explain this change in slope. Mm -hmm. So in fact, some people say that this is tantalizing that there could be some, <laughs> something there which could be primordial black holes or something else that we don't know mm -hmm. what it is. Okay. Right. But I am not an expert at all on this uh, modeling with uh, 
with the quasar, so I, I, I cannot yeah, really comment much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so on these bounds, am I right to think that if we had a whole bunch of ultralight axions or, or what have you, most of the power would be radiated into the light dark stuff and then these bounds just disappear? Mm, you mean if if you had a so if you had the primordial black holes and the axions the emission will be mostly into the axions and then you wouldn't see anything in the electromagnetic spectrum right i mean the yeah, yeah this is a possibility because the emission is basically controlled by the by the temperature so yeah okay uh, can i sorry guillermo can i comment is andrea here uh, i don't andrea know if Cap andrea yeah. caputo here <laughs> sure i mean sorry yeah no but uh, just a comment on this like uh, the Hawking radiation emission will emit uh, like a star, right? So you will not, you will change a bit the bound, but they will not disappear. And the sense that whatever particle, right, that you could produce with that, it's like a star when you have, you know, you produce neutrino and you produce also axion, right? It's a thermal emission. So it's not if you have like some massless particle, you just produce that and then this bound disappear, right? It's not that you probably you will evaporate faster because you have another channels of losing, for losing energy, right? But I don't think these bounds will disappear. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think I said it disappeared. I think it uh, it will change. No, 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 no. Exactly, exactly. But to to go back to the question, I think that is very. You know, there will be just yeah. another a, a little bit of you know like you know like a, a little bit. It will lose energy a little bit faster because you have an extra channel to emit stuff, right? But the spectrum is not really changing, so I think. That they will probably be almost the same. Even if you add, uh, you know, of course, if you have like 10,000 of axion, probably it will change a little bit more. But if you have, let's say, 100 of axion, then it will not change much. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, it's okay. I go on. Okay, so I was saying that there are a few other observables that they are also related to evaporation that put a uh, fairly comparable bounds. The one I was talking about before, it's uh, perhaps the most uh, robust of all of them because it, it depends on the extragalactic uh, diffuse background and the other ones are more uh, local. So they assume some, sometimes some profile for the, for the dark matter distribution on the galaxy or similar things. But the, the message is clear that black holes that are lighter than 10 to the 17 grams or so cannot uh, constitute all the dark matter, okay? And, uh, and as you see, the, the bound is very, quite vertical. So, so that's like a, a hard bound, okay? And then to the, to the other end of the window, we have uh, microlensing, which is a uh, defect that happens when one of these black holes passes in front of a star, for example. And there is a change in the luminosity of that uh, star that can be observed over a certain period of time. And again, you can use this to put uh, a bound on, on the abundance of the primordial black holes just by counting how many of these events you, you see. And there were in the past a few of these, of these uh, events that were uh, unexplained and people claim that this could be evidence of, uh, of uh, some primordial black hole but I'm talking about a handful of events. So nothing that could be of relevance for a cosmological, uh, cosmological abundance, okay? There are several experiments that have put, uh, sorry, this kind of bounds. Uh, there are some subtleties here when you get to light masses that have to do with how you model the, the optics of the, of the micro lenses that, uh, that changed the, this bound, which extended farther to the left before. But uh, as you see, they, they go to very high masses and, and they exclude basically uh, that black holes uh, could be all the dark matter up to a thousand solar masses or so, which is a strong, strong conclusion. Then we have bounds from, sorry, from a, uh, uh, from gravitational waves, uh, as I said, you can compare the, the number of mergers that are observed uh, by LIGO and Virgo with what you would expect if you, if, if you assume that uh, dark matter is made, is made of primordial black holes. And uh, this gives uh, this, this bound here. 
and the one on the on the top is uh, is a comparable one that uh, that assumes there is is different uh, signal. This is a stochastic background of of gravitational waves, and this is uh, from individual mergers. Okay, and both of them seem to exclude in the LIGO Virgo range again uh, that uh, primordial black holes could be the most uh, important contribution to dark matter. I assume, uh, I assume these constraints, they are now again assuming monochromatic mass distribution, and they are probably not assuming any clustering of primordial black holes, right? Yeah, so these, these ones so, don't assume any clustering. So in that sense, they are conservative, right? Well, I would say they are because mm -hmm. uh, to, I mean, this, this clustering story has been debated for, <laughs> for quite a bit in the, in the literature. What I think is, is missing there is, first of all, um, a model that explains uh, why this clustering uh, happens when mm -hmm. the black holes are produced, and that quantitatively uh, gives you what would be the merger rate that you would expect from a certain mm -hmm. cluster distribution. That, that I haven't seen very precise. Yeah. Therefore, at the moment, uh, this is what I take as uh, right. yeah, that makes the sense. most uh, trustable. But Certainly, there is the possibility that uh, if there is some particular distribution of, of black holes, the, the merger rate will, of course, change. And people have studied this with uh, embodied simulations, for example, that they do specifically for this. But uh, it's, uh, it's, at the moment, I think it's hard to tell whether this could really yeah. open the, the window for, for these masses, okay? Mm -hmm. Not, not only because there are these bounds, but also because there are the micro lensing bounds and some other bounds that I will, I will comment in the next slide that seem to point all of them that uh, this window is not really favored for, for dark matter. But wouldn't clustering even make the merger rate larger? Well, that, that, so was the, that was the original idea that I thought that I thought, okay, if these black holes are clustered, they will be closer. Therefore, they will be meeting each other more often and you will see more mergers. But what some, some analysis, numerical analysis show is that uh, the effect of uh, other black holes that are uh, passing nearby, two of them- that oh, They disrupt be, the binaries right, then, yeah, yeah. That they yeah. could be potentially uh, clustering, sorry, emerging, they don't do it because of mm -hmm. the tidal effects, if you want to call them like that, okay? Yeah. But so it's, it's delicate and there's still uh, work on this, but, but the main point is that these are not the only constraints that uh, are, uh, you know, uh, closing in this window. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's also important, okay? Yeah, thanks. Work. Okay, so in fact, uh, let me just say a couple of things about that uh, a bit more. So this, as you know, uh, it was in 2016 or 15, yeah, when LIGO detected the first uh, merger uh, of solar, of uh, black holes that had, uh, that were quite heavy, around 30 solar masses or so. And there were a couple of papers that proposed that perhaps this could be uh, the, the a signature of, of dark matter. And uh, today we we think that in reality, this is uh, most likely not the case, not, not only because of uh, these constraints that I saw you, but also because the model that was used to, to compute the merger rate in, in those papers assumed that the black holes were, were meeting uh, and forming the binaries in halos, in dark matter halos. But in reality, there was a there was a much earlier proposal by Nakamura, Kip Thorne, and other people that saw that if uh, primordial black holes uh, really exist, they they will form binaries in the very early universe, in the radiation epoch, and the merger rate that you would uh, estimate from that process of uh, binary formation is much higher than the one that uh, that corresponds to the formation of binaries in the late universe. And, and this is really the, the reason why those bounds that I am showing you there are different from, from the ones that were used to, to, to postulate this idea that, that black holes could be dark matter and that spurred all this interest uh, recently, okay? I thought there was a question there, but uh, maybe not, okay. So the way in which this mechanism uh, of uh, early universe formation works is that you have two, two black holes that in absence of any other force will be colliding uh, heads on, uh, basically once against the other. But then if there is a fair black hole around, it produces a, a torque. Um, and this is the one that, uh, that, makes, uh, that makes the binary possible, okay? 
And uh, as uh, Joachim, Joachim was asking, of course, this, this very simplified picture might change if you have uh, many other black holes around that are, uh, that are having some influence in the dynamics of the two bodies that you're considering, okay? So the, there are people that have studied uh, what is the effect of having an extra black hole uh, in, this, in this picture here. That's what we did and with, which other people did. And we saw analytically that it's probably not very large, but once you go to, to do simulations, there are, there are people that have, that have found other results. So this story of the, of the clustering is still uh, under construction, let's say. Okay, so as I said, there are more bounds in, in this uh, LIGO window and, and also for higher masses. Uh, the most important ones perhaps are the, the accretion bounds and in particular the ones that uh, you would infer from, from the CMB. So here the idea is, is that if you have these black holes that are accreting, uh, accreting matter, this would uh, heat up the, the CMB and this is something we should see and, uh, and we don't. And as you see, they, they also are uh, quite strong in, in this region of about a hundred solar masses or so. Now these bounds depend a little bit on, on what is the model of accretion that you use. Uh, the accretion could be what is called Bondi accretion in which the particles fall radially into the, into the black hole or they could be falling in forming an accretion disk around them. And this changes a little bit the bounds as I will show in the next slide, but I would say they are, they're pretty robust, okay? And then there are also these, uh, these dynamical bounds which come from the, from the perturbation of the dynamics of these objects. What's the reason that the uh, constraint from X-ray observations has this peculiar shape? So it seems to be pretty strong, but then it cuts off uh, outside a rather narrow range of masses. Is this because we don't properly understand the accretion dynamics uh, outside that range or what's, what's the reason? I don't case? know. Okay. I don't know, sorry. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is the effect of, uh, of the accretion actually in the case of the CMB, and uh, well, the main point is that uh, depending on the model of accretion that you that you assume, you could exclude even up to up to ten or uh, one solar mass uh, black holes from being all the dark matter. And I would say it is more motivated to, to consider the disk uh, accretion rather than this spherical accretion, because this is what happens with most uh, astrophysical systems that, uh, that we know of, okay? <clears throat> All right, so, so that's a summary of the bounds. And as I said, uh, what is very interesting here is that we have this uh, open window and there's a lot of activity trying to, to close it. So if you have a good idea or, about how to do this, uh, well, it's uh, it's something that could have some some impact, okay, to do it. And let me also say that uh, this has been evolving quite rapidly in the last two or three years. So this was the situation before 2019 or so, when there were a few papers, including one by Joachim here and collaborators of him at CERN that showed that uh, previously existing uh, bounds precisely in this uh, asteroid mass window are not really reliable for a variety of, of different reasons. Uh, one, some of them because the, the analysis of the lensing that had to be performed in order to, to take into account these uh, fast uh, femtolensing events of gamma ray bars was not, uh, was not uh, trustable. You can ask uh, Joachim uh, for more details about that. Uh, and then there are a couple of bounds more that went away that have to do with uh, the dynamics of uh, either a white dwarf or a neutron star eating a black hole or a, or a black hole passing through them and the, the nuclear reactions that, that this could trigger and the, the abundance of these objects that you would expect from what will happen there. And the, the calculations are very complicated there, but uh, if, if you do a detailed analysis, these two bounds also go away. And as I said, these uh, microlensing uh, bounds from Subaru will, were also changed from this slanted line here to the vertical one. So this open up for dark matter. 
Okay, so this was about the bounds, and now let me say a couple of things about uh, formation. If I have still, uh, how much time do I have? Like five, ten minutes? Okay. So formation, uh, there are several ideas to form black holes. Sorry? Do you need more? I think that minutes uh, would do. Ten, okay. it's okay. Seven, yeah, ten. Yeah, ten is fine. Okay, yeah, that, that will be fine. I mean, if people then ask, we will see. That. <laughs> Seven, ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, so there are, there are a few ideas. So one is uh, phase transition and the collision of bubbles, as uh, Joachim was telling us. It was also proposed that the primordial black holes could be formed from the, from the intersections of the kinks of cosmic strings. And the most popular mechanism uh, in terms of a uh, number of papers produced, uh, not necessarily the most uh, promising, is from inflation, okay? Large fluctuations from inflation. And this is what I will talk about. So the idea in itself is, uh, is pretty nice because uh, basically it's that, okay, so we have this, uh, quantum fluctuations from inflation that give, ri give rise to the temperature and isotropies on the CMB and also to the seeds of uh, galaxies and large scale structure. So what would happen if these fluctuations were not so small, but they will be larger at smaller scales? Well, they could produce uh, black holes and then maybe they could account also for the, for the dark matter. So it's something very minimal and potentially very nice. So, yeah, the idea is just that if you have some Hubble patch that is overdense for some reason, and that reason is inflation, instead of expanding as all the other uh, patches of the universe, eventually will will collapse uh, like so uh, into a black hole. Okay, uh, so during inflation we produce these uh, these fluctuations. Uh, when the fluctuations become a super horizon, they freeze out. And if they are sufficiently large, uh, when they re-enter, possibly during the radiation epoch, they will enter into causal contact and, and you will form a, a black hole, okay? That's uh, very schematically the idea. Of course, these fluctuations could also enter uh, here during matter domination. If you have some epoch of reheating or something else, changing a little bit the expansion history of the universe. And the mechanism by which the black holes will form during radiation or matter is slightly different. Here is, is more favorable to form black holes just because you don't have uh, radiation pressure. And, uh, and the, abundance of the abundance of the black holes that you would compute for a, for a given size of the fluctuations is, is, uh, is higher, okay, in this case. This is something I study a little bit with, with Fabrizio here. But in general, the mass is going to be given just by the, by the size of a, of, a, of a Hubble patch that contains these large fluctuations, okay? The mass contained inside a Hubble patch that is collapsing. And you can connect this uh, during inflation to the, to the number of FIFOs. And so given a mass, um, you can compute uh, at which time of the epoch of inflation you need to produce a large fluctuation, okay? In order to have uh, black holes. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that the, the fluctuations that you need to form the black holes are pretty large. So basically, uh, they are to the right of the tails of the distribution of the curvature fluctuation that you produce during inflation. And um, basically the idea is that in order to compute the abundance, you need to know what is the integral below this curve here, right? But in order to do it accurately, you really need to know what is the shape of this thing. And this is hard to compute uh, in inflation, especially when you have uh, large fluctuations. So what people typically assume is that these fluctuations are Gaussian, but this might not be a very good approximation in, in realistic cases. If you do this, uh, this approximation, there is something missing here. And what is missing here is that uh, the size of the fluctuations that you will need in order to account for all the dark matter is about seven orders of magnitude larger than the ones that we see or that we infer from the CMB, which is a lot, okay? And this is what makes uh, implementing this in specific models uh, of inflation quite complicated, right? Okay, so what you need is uh, 
if you want a model of inflation that accounts for the temperature and isotropies on the CMB and, and also for, for dark matter, you need uh, these conditions. So you need to produce the masses in the region that we are interested in, this asteroid Mars region. You need to agree with the CMB and all the cosmological data. You need enough inflation to solve the horizon or flatness problems. And you need an abundance of black holes that is or the order of, of the dark matter abundance. And this is very constraining, but it is possible to do it if you play a little bit. So uh, it was actually done already in uh, the 90s. And, and the very simple idea to do this is to consider that if you have some inflaton rolling down some potential, it uh, slows down sufficiently uh, during some, some time of its dynamics. And this is because the power spectrum in the slow roll approximation is inversely proportional to the speed of the inflaton when it goes down its potential. So if it goes down sufficiently slow, then you will produce a peak in the primordial fluctuations and this will give rise to the, to the black holes. So this is the, the basic idea and this is a more modern incarnation of that in a, in a specific model. One way to do it, uh, is to, well, you need this flat part here to feed the CMB. This can be done with a Lagrangian of this kind. And this here can be done in many different ways. So one possibility, this is what you need, uh, sorry, this is what you need to, to slow down the, to slow down the inflaton, okay? This kind of feature in a single field model. So this can be done simply by, by considering a polynomial or by considering an effective potential or in which, uh, the effective quartic coupling of the of the inflaton has some quantum corrections, and, and if the beta functions of this effective coupling are of the same order at a specific scale, then you can have this kind of feature. And this is similar to similar to what happens when you extend the, the standard model to very high to very high values of the Higgs, okay, where this coupling becomes very small. Okay, so very quickly, uh, this is what we did in some papers some time ago. And at that time we had these constraints. And what was interesting is that we found that that kind of model, if you um, not only require a large amplitude of uh, primordial black holes, but also, but, also, um, but also to fit the CMB properly, the black holes come naturally, well, not naturally. I mean, they, they really come uh, in this region of masses, which later became the one that uh, we now consider open for the dark matter. And this is a nice uh, coincidence or something to think about, okay? And I have a few, a few more things, but maybe I, I should stop uh, because I think I'm going over, over time. So yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, you, you can observe these black holes indirectly through a stochastic background of gravitational waves that is induced if you have these large, uh, this kind of large peak in the in the power spectrum for the fluctuations. Okay, but if someone has questions about this, maybe maybe we can discuss later because I think I'm really very much over time. No. So yeah, let me let me end here. Yeah, thank you. Questions. Um, apologies if this is a very dumb question, but this uh, proportionality of the power spectrum to one over phi dot squared. I, I know that this comes out of the equations, but is there any intuition one can develop for why this is the case? Why does a slower, uh, uh, a more slowly rolling scalar field imply that the amplitude of the fluctuations becomes larger? Uh, physical intuition for this? <laughs> Well, uh, I think no is a perfectly acceptable answer. Yes, <laughs> but, uh, but I should have a better answer than no. Uh, no, but I'm sure somebody here has an answer for this. Marco, yes. The, the intuition is that in, in that limit, what, what, what this actually measures is how large are quantum mechanical fluctuations compared to the classical motion. Yeah. And so when phi dot goes to zero, the classical motion goes to zero. So, um, uh, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Thanks,
So yeah. can, can I ask about the, yes. the gravitational waves? So they, these are mostly secondary gravitational waves? Yes, so this, yeah, let me just comment on what Marco was saying. So in fact, one of the, Joaquin, one of the complications to, to characterize the tail of the distribution is uh, computing properly these, uh, these effects that Marco is, is talking about. So you have to compare the, the classical rolling, the semi-classical rolling of the field with these uh, quantum jumps. And these quantum jumps become more and more important the, the slower the field is going. Yeah. So, so this is part of the difficulty. And there are people that say that you cannot use the standard perturbation theory that we use in inflation to get this kind of formula, for example, to really estimate the, the abundance. Yeah. yeah, and for the gravitational waves, so what happens is that, uh, so these fluctuations here are of, of the order of 10 to the minus two or so in the curvature fluctuation. These are small, so you can still treat them in a linear approximation. Mm -hmm. But they are not so small that they cannot uh, induce something else at second order where you have nothing at first order. Okay, and this is specifically what happens for gravitational waves at these scales. Okay, so this is uh, so. For example, if you have this kind of peak here, this is the abundance of primordial black holes that you have, and this will be the the induced second order gravitational wave uh, spectrum that you would expect. And it so happens that if you have the black holes, sorry, in, in this mass range, the frequency at which they, they peak these uh, gravitational waves is precisely where LISA should have its uh, best sensitivity, which is quite uh, interesting, okay? Yeah, thank you. Oh. Thank you. That was a really great overview. Um, do we understand at some level uh, uh, what sort of distribution of angular momenta uh, for the black holes too, uh, of, of spin? Uh, 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 you mean we need in which sense need? Which is, so I'm, I'm not sure if I understood. So, uh, just, just what? Uh, in the, oh God. Kerr, uh, J, right, uh, uh, angular momentum? Yeah, yeah, but, but you mean, I mean, they don't need to have any, so they could have, uh, so the, the, the simplest uh, thing that people consider is that they are spinless, okay? For example, the bounds that I, I put them, assume that they are uh, right. sparsely black holes, and that's, okay? If they form during radiation domination, people typically tend to think that the spins are small. Okay. But it is true that uh, the spin could perhaps be used to distinguish astrophysical and primordial black holes. So if but, they form during matter domination, you, you want to say something? No. If they form during matter domination, people say perhaps they have a, a more uh, significant spin and this could be a, a signature, okay? Okay, and, and so does that include the, the inflationary? The, the well, yes, that we this, this could include the inflationary. I mean, it is so if they form because of the there is some large fluctuation. In principle, this doesn't have uh, that much to do with the spin because the spin really comes from from what happens uh, here when they form. Okay, so you have these uh, overdensities and they have to collapse somehow. Hole. So if you have some initial uh, angular momentum, then this could be transmitted to the black hole. And this is more likely to happen here because uh, there is some, well, yeah, because there is no pressure basically. And here there is, which will erase the, the angular momentum. Okay, that's the picture more or less. They will accrete and spin up just like number, normal. I so cannot hear you, sorry. You, they, they accrete. Right, they accrete stuff they accrete. and then they spin up a serial, a serial other black yes, hole. Yes, but, but we, we, I mean, this depends on the mass that they have mm -hmm. and what is the abundance, of course. But I think I'm, I'm not really an expert on the accretion, but as far as I understood, the accretion does not change uh, by a lot the angular momentum. Okay, actually, by very little. Uh, uh, that's, yeah, I'm, I but guess it, I'm that depends confused. on the mass, okay? Yeah, but I thought that like adding on time is mass independent, right? 
isn't it? And and if it accretes at Eddington, then Eddington time, I thought it was like 10 to the eight years for any mass of black hole, right? Because it's m dot over m, it's mass independent. Yeah. And then it's okay, maybe yeah, maybe it just depends on, on mass somehow, but I, I I just don't understand very well how. Maybe we can we yep. can yep. discuss it sure. a bit later. Also because I cannot hear you so well from here. Right. <laughs> so it's hard to answer. Sorry, can I ask? Uh, yeah. Can you go back to the, the potential program? Yes. Oh, no, that's too much, right? Yeah. Uh, this way. Yeah, the other way. Yeah, that's good. So, so I was. So I just wanted to ask: Has anyone considered think the thing that produces the perturbations? The usual decider perturbations but has anyone considered like instead of doing a slowdown suppose there's like a barrier there where you can tunnel through yes. by, by a first order phase transition and then the the thing that will be producing the perturbation is the just the the, the bubbles right so uh, in fact in this uh, in this picture here uh, it's a bit uh, misleading because if you want to get a very large peak like the one I was showing, this is what you will need in principle with this Gaussian assumption to have all the dark matter. You really need a tiny, uh, a tiny, a tiny mountain there that, that you have to overshoot, and this is what uh, in the. But this is this yeah, you this overshoot. Is, this is uh, you overshoot by classically. Uh, classically yeah. yeah. Now, if you start to make the barrier higher and higher, then classically you will get stuck. And then you would have to estimate what is the tunneling probability, okay? Right. And this is something we tried to do uh, for a paper that we, we wrote in which we actually look at the potential which had many of these minima because we would, there is some tuning here, of course, to produce this feature. And we yeah, wanted to get rid of it. And we said, okay, we have many minima and the, the potential eventually stops in one of these minima. Maybe we can get rid of the tune. So we, we found that for some parameters, you, you were getting stuck and you were not getting a large peak. And then we had this question of uh, whether you could produce them by, by tunneling. Mm -hmm. And I think the conclusion was that the, basically either you get stuck and you don't get anything or, or you go through almost without, uh, without getting stuck and then you get a large peak. But, but why is that? I mean, yeah, you think is more than uh, yeah. Hubble time, right? Yeah. But that's Sure. Not sorry. I think uh, so. I think the, there is indeed a way to make black holes also in this way. This is a paper by Vilenkin and Garriga, mm -hmm. or by Vilenkin separately, and then another update by Garriga, I think, where they consider getting stuck in a false minimum during inflation for a while, then tunneling through by other directions, maybe also, not just. Uh, and then these bubbles. So, what you're referring about bubbles that expand and then would collapse back at. Uh, would re-enter the Hubble horizon. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So this mechanism also with topological defects exists. Uh, you can find the paper by Vilenkin and by Garriga. But but I don't think you can implement it here, right? Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, as you said, I think they were tunneling in some other direction or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember exactly the details of how, but the idea, I mean, also by formation of topological defects is more or less the same. You can nucleate a domain wall or something like that, then you expand of the horizon and then it re-enters at some point. So it's more or less these, these models exist in the literature, yes. But it's something that we can check. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank uh, Guillermo again. Okay.